Hey, and welcome. This is going to be a painting demo in real time. And this is sort of part two of this. For the, let's go over the palette first. The palette is called the Zorn palette after uh, the painter Anders Zorn. And it involves four colors. It involves black, white, um, in this case, titanium white. The black is an ivory or a Mars black which is kind of a cold black. The yellow is yellow ochre. The red is cadmium red light. In this case, I don't think that's the original colors, but those are the ones that you can get easily now. Um, it's a primary color palette, kind of. The black acts as a blue in this case. So if you feel the need to cool colors down, um, you use the black. It has obvious deficiencies because it's not a full palette. And in fact, Anders Zorn would use ultramarine blue if he needed an absolute blue. Um, it's not gonna work super well for landscapes. Um, as you'll see in this demo, it's quite difficult to um, get the skin tones that you want for all skin colors and types. But that's okay, because this is an exercise in, you know, using a limited palette. The advantage of a limited palette is it reduces the number of decisions that you have to make and it provides an automatic color unity. So that's why we're after this particular palette. Um, it's also a really good palette if you want to try a new medium and you don't want to invest in a full palette of new colors, especially if you wind up not liking the medium. So if you wanted to get into oil paint, you could get um, an oil painting medium, these four paints, and get started. Um, so that's it about the palette, really. I like to do a lot of uh, brush mixing when I'm doing quick studies because it doesn't require the precision needed to mix every color individually. Um, and brush mixing on the palette gives you sort of a range and you see the, the colors that you mixed before and you can kind of get make relative judgments on the palette. Um, we're building this off of a, a three-tone uh, a three -tone, no ton painting, as you'll see. And right now I'm just working in the darks. And the reason that I'm starting with the darks is um, because I want to immediately get a, a sense of what colors that I can use in the darks. One of the main artistic choices that I'm using here is that I'm eliminating most of the information in the darks. Like if I squint at the reference photo, um, I see a lot of information in the lights, but I don't in the darks. So I don't even think that I'm going to include eyes or many facial features in the dark side of this. And I think that's the interesting thing about painting is that you get to do stuff like that. Um, you get to eliminate a lot of elements into uh, dark shadows. In photography, you could do that, but it would require a lot of editing. Um, and in some sense, I think that's easier to do in paint. And what I'm thinking for this shadow is that it's going to be kind of like a dark orange. So I mixed up kind of a little bit of all three of the colors. It, it's leaning more towards red. Um, there's a bit of glare on the image itself. But you'll see later on as this dries more and more matte that it is kind of a, an orange in particular. The thing that I also wanted to note just as a general painting approach is that um, you shouldn't be afraid at any point in a painting, no matter how far along you are uh, of making big dramatic changes to the painting. Because if your instinct is telling you that what you have achieved isn't what you want in the end, I think it's fine just to just to change it completely. You know, the, the challenge with painting um, with a physical medium is that you have paint buildup. When you're working digitally, you know, you don't have paint buildup and you have layers so you can work your way back. Um, in one sense, a painting is always progressing forward physically. Um, 
But if you need to back up and reevaluate and change your initial shapes or pick up things that you didn't see or eliminate things that you saw in the beginning, you want to ha have the freedom to do that, to reevaluate, to make changes. The changes that I see are some of the, some of the dark shapes aren't quite the way I want them. The, the top of the hat's too tall. Um, I like in the reference how, how you only see a little bit of the top of the hat. Um, you know, and we want to examine things like the level of detail that we want. We want to be sure that we're getting big, medium, and small shapes and that they're all balanced. Um, one of the difficulties I find, and I remember having as a beginner, um, and in some ways I'm still a beginner, uh, it, it's integrating the figure in the ground. I think when we all started, we drawing and painting we all started making like characters and just putting them in the center of a page and not really thinking about well hey like there could be a background or a scene or this could be like involved as a thing so when we're creating a portrait like this we want to be sure that we um, get a full composition going so what I'm doing here is I've mixed sort of a greenish color with the yellow ochre and the black and that's going to represent the sort of uh, tree green that's very blurred out in the background. And I don't even need detail in the background to make this portrait work. I just need those colors and those values to begin to separate the, the figure and from the ground. But at the same time, as I separate the figure and ground, I want to be sure that it's integrated. Um, and the way that that integrates in the Zorn palette is, you know, simply by using the palette because you're so limited on colors. The idea is that when you need integration, you kind of need to use all of the colors in your palette everywhere. So if we were using a blue to get this like blue green shape in the background, we would take that blue and then use that somewhere in the figure or in the face. Um, most likely we'd, we'd use it on the right side where there's reflected light. Um, we're also focusing on local color here. Um, local color is the opposite of modeled color. So if in an area you see it red um, or orange, you simply paint that as red or orange. You don't transition a lot of color within any given area. Um, so that means that when we want to um, paint, say, the, the sweater, we're going to use basically the same color and just switch values as we go along to differentiate it. Um, of course, you know, you can't help but modulate color some when you're mixing because it's never going to be exactly the same. but. Um, what, what we want to focus on is like, you know, say, let's take the hat, the face, and the sweater. Each of those has a very similar tone, which is what's really interesting about this particular reference, but they're slightly different. And what we want to do is pick up on those slight differences in local color and use that to help further our painting. The, um, you'll notice that the skin tone without an ultramarine blue is almost impossible to get. But it's interesting because we're, we're pushing to the limit of what the Zorn palette can do. And when you push to the limit of the palette, um, that shows you what colors you need to add to your palette. So in some sense, working with a limited palette is about, um, you know, exploring creativity through limitation and then figuring out like hey if I remove that limitation what could I do um, so here I think the next thing is to kind of work the edge between the dark that I that I had painted earlier and this background and when when you're working edges um, sometimes you want to paint along the edge um, but you want to be careful about that because a ridge of paint can easily make things look kind of 
like a paper cutout sitting on top of another paper cutout. So what I like to do to create a good edge variety while still maintaining a certain amount of sharpness is work either at a perpendicular or like sort of an odd angle to the edge. That way I can control the softness or hardness of the edge a little bit better. Um, I think a lot of paintings create a, a figure ground reversal by having too sharp of an edge or too high and too high of a value contrast. Because if you're using a super sharp edge, you don't need as big of a value contrast. Um, so just be aware of that when you're painting. You don't want your, your paint to look sort of cut out from itself. Um, and some of that has to do with brush direction. You know, other than that, brush direction doesn't matter as much. You can choose to do things like, um, like you would with drawing and sort of cross hatch with a brush or hatch with a brush and follow the form with the brush marks. Um, Rembrandt used to do that and uh, when you see them in person, you'll, um, you'll see these huge networks of, of mark making and it's really actually uh, kind of incredible. Um, and we can do that too. Um, and, and, I, and you'll see that when we approach this sweater. Um, keeping your brush clean periodically is always a good tip. Um, either just through wiping it off on a rag or getting some water and wetting it down and then wiping it off on a rag. Um, water is the solvent of acrylic, so that means it breaks down the acrylic. So when you're thinning acrylic, you could use water, um, but it'll kind of break down the, the chemical composition. So that's why I like matte medium. So here, uh, I think what's going to be interesting about this is to use marks that help the, with the texture um, and the direction that this sweater is going. So what I see is um, a network of more like vertically emphasized marks on the sweater, um, more so than I see horizontals. Um, we could probably bring in a little bit of both, but we don't have to. And here I've mixed kind of a, uh, a cooler and lighter brown through mixing in a little bit of, uh, a little bit of red, a little bit of yellow, a little bit of black, and just kind of tweaking that with, um, with some white and just seeing like where I can go with this. The, um, the fun thing about using the Zorn palette and then establishing a black and white painting first is that the black and white part of the Zorn palette and you immediately kind of get some color unity out of it, which is interesting, you know. Some palettes don't use black. Um, and generally speaking, I prefer not to use black because it, it's sort of flat, but this is a, kind of a way around that. So here I'm getting the marks to kind of like wrap around the shoulder and um, come down the chest here on the sweater. And note that I'm just kind of tracking the vertical parts of the texture in the sweater. And in those halftone areas, I kind of lifted them out of how dark they were and they're getting a little lighter. I think um, colorful paintings require that you be sort of more towards the, the middle of the value range because black and white have no color. Um, what I noticed about the back where the shoulder seam is is that looks more like a flat shape. So I decided to change the direction and go along the edge with the brush mark, you know? And that established like a good textural way to differentiate the peak of the shoulder from the back of the shoulder. Cause he seems a little hunched over, you know? And the other thing about this, about painting in general is a good 90% of it is filling in. Um, once you fill in the, the paper or the canvas, the surface, uh, once you eliminate all of your underpainting and you're working with the colors that are close to what you want to finish with, 
that's when things get interesting and that's when you can start really evaluating decisions. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind is that in the beginning, you know, you're just getting color on, on the, on the uh, canvas. And if you're confident, once you fill it in, you can stop. Um, and you'll have these moments when you have a lot, uh, a lot more experience that you can do like a one layer direct painting and it'll be good. And that's a good way to practice too. But um, for now, you may need to do the, the noton as your layer one, a fill layer of like your basic local colors. And then you may need one more layer just to refine that and to make, uh, to make relative changes. Um, what I do is uh, I'll step six feet away from my painting and just sit there for like five or 10 minutes and just mentally note all the things that I don't like about it. And then try to figure out why. And then if I can figure out why, then I know how to fix them. Um, and if I don't know how to fix them, then I ask you know one of my friends to help me out. Like, hey, this bothers me about this painting. You know, what do you think I should change? Um, and that can open up some suggestions too. In class, it's great because you have a teacher and you can say, hey, like, what's wrong with this? Why don't I like it? I don't like this aspect. And, you know, we can work on it. Um, I think one of the interesting things that'll bring a little bit of local color unity is the um, neckline of the sweater. Um, and here, this is even the wrong neckline that I'm putting in. Um, it's a little closer to the... That's a little closer now, there. Um, so now I have to go back and correct the bottom of that neckline. You can paint wet and wet in acrylic. You just kind of have to account for that. And you might need to go over things a couple of times to um, reestablish that value change if you paint wet and wet. Um, so now we're nearing a point where if we cover up the rest of the white, everything will kind of begin to look like something. I think my goal here is to establish everything but the face and ha so that I have a good established relative color range to work with in the background. Because what you're trying to do is judge, like, how do I put the right colors in the most important part? And if I leave that kind of um, towards the end, then I know a little bit more about my palette. I know about the relative color differences that I'm setting up. And so I'm aiming for that, but I'm, you know, kind of dancing around the subject. Um, and having those darks put in there definitely does help um, with that. You know, the other thing too is like, I'm getting more experience with the Zorn palette here as I paint and I'm figuring out the colors that I can make. And I'm thinking, is this color gonna help me with the facial features, the skin tones. So since I don't have a direct blue, I have to go in with a gray. And I mean, I could leave that gray that's there in the underpainting, but I don't think that'll be interesting. I think introducing a little more white and having a brush mixed gives it a little more texture, a little more variety. And then I also wanna pick up the, that there's like uh, two different values to that um, tent or whatever it is in the background in that shape. There's a light value and there's a sort of medium value. And I can get that in. You know, the nice thing about uh, painting in this way is that you can kind of evaluate as you go. Um, and that to me is really powerful. You know, I can. I can see what I painted and then evaluate and make changes right there. 
So now I've finally begun to really heavily correct the top of the hat and get to the shape that I actually want for that. Um, and there'd be a little textural ridge under there, but that's okay. And here the sky's pretty desaturated blue, uh, fairly bright. So I need to patch those shapes in. And then look for any colors that are kind of close to that. And since I have that color there, I can use that to kind of finish correcting the hat shape at the top. So one of the most important things at this stage is to, once you have an area of color laid down, um, don't make cha changes to it too much until you've covered the whole canvas. So once you covered the whole canvas, then you can start making more second layer color judgments until you have a good relative color range uh, laid out. You can't really make those judgments accurately. Once you have the, the color kind of distributed around the whole canvas, it'd be easier to make those judgments. You know, like this color that I'm putting down isn't what I'm going to want in the end. Um, and I will have to go back and change it. But what it gives me is, is a certain color, a certain baseline to judge from. From here, I can I can refine as needed. Um, and I'll know, I'll better know how far off this color is once I finish the rest, in, like kind of inputting the rest of the color. And you'll notice too that the more of these white areas that I cover up, the more it gets unified and the more interesting it gets. Um, covering up these grays and inserting color to the grays helps as well. In the end, the blacks also have to get lifted pretty far up so that you can even perceive color there. Um, and I find that pretty interesting. It, if the blacks are like too dark, too, too close to black, it kind of, um, you kind of lose out on that opportunity for color that you have. Yeah, you see how the the top there of the of the hat isn't really working out against that against that um, middle value for the front of the hat. Um, I don't think I think the middle value for the front of the hat is better than the top. And, and this is the interesting thing that should be comforting as a as a beginning painter, um, or really at any stage is that um, you know not all paintings begin good. Some people are very good at, at, at beginning well, but um, that's not the only way to work. And you know you can begin loosely and if you have a good eye for refinement and a good um, diagnostic sensibility of kind of like knowing how to do better and, and what to do to fix something, then you're just as well off as starting well, you know, maybe even better because you'll, you have, um, a, you'll have a developed sense of how to kind of, you know, self-police your paintings. So here, we're getting like very close to the the home stretch here um we're about we're a little over halfway through the demo and as you finish it it, it becomes necessary to kind of slow down and to really think and to really analyze um 
you don't want to rush to the end. This is um, overall a very short painting process that we're doing. You know, we're not doing a 20 minute portrait painting, um, which is like hyper fast. But then we're not doing a multi-day painting either. Um, I think a good amount of time to spend on something like this is anywhere from uh, an hour to an hour and a half up to maybe three hours. Um, you know, it's uh, like what I would call a, a third of a day or a half day session and um, at the most. It's a good amount of time. Because I knew quickly that that initial color wasn't right, I'm actually kind of cheating and putting in a different color for it for now. And you'll notice how different that color is from the actual um, sweater, which is what I want. I want a different color than the sweater overall. And then I probably need a lighter, brighter color for the plane of the... Um, of the brim of the hat. But I don't want it to be too different from the top. And then note that along that edge, I'm using brush marks that go perpendicular, at least to lay it out. And then I'm coming back and putting brush marks that follow the brim a little bit better. It's a subtlety, but to me, those subtleties kind of matter a fair amount. You know, a painter like Vincent van Gogh would like have very dramatic brush marks. Um, we don't have to have those dramatic brush marks to make use of the same sort of tactic. Um, we can make them more subtle. So I think now it's time to really get into the, uh, the face and try to attempt some skin tones. Um, there's a very like reddish skin tone um, that's on this highlight side. Uh, if we had like uh, an ultramarine blue in the palette, we could make sort of a, a, a be begin with a violet, you know actually would, would work really well and then modulate it with a little more red and, and some black and white and we could get to the right saturations but you know I really want to stick to the Zorn palette um, even though I know that the skin tone is not going to be right um, objectively speaking. At the end of the day we throw the reference out and we keep the painting right <laughs> and that's what matters. So as long as you get an interesting painting I think that's fine. And what I want to do is every time that I use a particular color, um, I want to find an area where the, either the same or sim similar color exists. And if I can use the exact same paint that I've mixed for another area, I want to do that because um, it just saves time. You know, I don't have to remix those colors. It's about efficiency, you know. I know that in the beard and in the hair, I'm going to need silvery tones. Um, but I can probably put them on top of this particular color and it'll work out well. And, um, you know, proportionally when you're drawing portraits, you know, like a lot of people get super technical with it. For me, I found the one that just really helps more than anything else is just the eyes go dead center. So if I measure from the tip of the chin to the crown of the head and the crown of the head is kind of at the back of the head, or the back of the top of the skull. If I, if I go halfway, that's where my eyes are. And then the, the whole of the ear, um, where your eardrum is and where you'd stick a Q-tip is halfway as well. So um, I think that's just the most important proportion to keep in, keep in mind. Um, that'll kind of anchor you and um, you know, the rest 
are they get technical really quickly and you'll develop an instinct for them. Um, when you're doing like figure drawing, maybe in portrait drawing, that matters more. Um, and if things get really off, you can use those technical things to measure. But um, I wouldn't suggest that uh, while you're just trying to learn about color and lighting, you know, de-emphasize proportions, emphasize something else, and come back and integrate your proportional knowledge after you do some figure drawing. Um, and I kind of wanted to take a stab at this highlight here and this, uh, this top plane of the cheekbone. So it's kind of catching a lot of light. Um, there's a lot of light on the lip as well. What I notice if I squint at this again is that the highlights really jump pretty far from that value. So I need a big value jump for those highlights. And I may have to come back and refine those later as well. So here I'm kind of in the home stretch of you know, pass two through the painting. Um, almost all of the white is covered up. Almost all of the black is covered up. The grays are almost all color covered up. And um, once I cover the last bit of, of all of that initial noton, I'll know exactly what I have to do because I'll then have a very, a fairly accurate, um, representation of what my color range is going to be like. And once I fill these all in, then I can better judge my relative color choices. Because that's the thing, color choices are always done in relation to each other. You know, there's no like such thing as an objective color choice. So I have to explore um, one color next to another color. And then here, since I've been painting for like 30 minutes, I'll have to start washing my brush a little more because, you know, the paint buildup gets into the brush a lot and that kind of creates problems. Um, And here I can start playing with like pushing some saturation up or, or down, um, finding brighter colors. Because when I'm working on the on the light side, you know, that's where I'm gonna find some some nice rich light and bright colors. Um, and I can play around with, you know, just how saturated I want things to be. Just how pure of a color that needs to come across. And at a certain point, a lot of this also becomes about edge handling. You know, how do you handle edges? Like how do you blend edges um, as well? And I think the way to think about it is when you're modulating color or value on a form, you want them to kind of be soft. Um, you don't want them to be too hard of an edge. Um, you know, when you hit a shadow, the shadow can be a little more of a hard edge. But within one area of the figure, you want that to be kind of soft. And then here, we're getting down to very small areas. Notice that the front of the nose has a fairly reddish spot on it, where it like, faces the, the um, camera directly here. Then what I do is look for other little areas that have reddish spots on them. Modulate that slightly. So here I need to fill in the rest of the lip. The top of the lip's kind of warm, the bottom of the lip's kind of cool. So a cooler version of that will work pretty well. And then um,
you know, I want to change. There's a lot of complexity around the lip and um, the muscle structure and this, the skin and like the deep indention um, that makes the cheek pop out in this figure. And I think catching on onto a couple of those shapes is going to be um, pretty useful. And this is a big change that I have to make is he has a very distinctive upper lip shape and I want to get that. Um, I'm also going to lift that shape out of the darkness too. It's going to be more of a middle value shape. And then I can use similar colors in that uh, indentation around the nose and under the cheek. And I just want to go in very delicately because there are a lot of really small distinctive shapes here that are going to need um, a lot of attention. And I can pull some of this dark shape into a little more half tone if I, if I think I need it. It's a little piece there that hadn't really been touched much. Need a color for the top of the chin. And so that right there, this point is a pivotal point. This is where I've finished my second pass and now I can make color judgments and go in just one more time very quickly and begin to really refine this and get this the way that I want. So getting the light that hits right under the bottom lip is really important. Um, it was kind of existing in shadow and it didn't really need to be. Um, you know, now I'm getting out the small brush um, and I think what I need to do is just hit those highlights um, with almost a completely pure white and allow them to jump off and see what happens if I hit those highlights. I see one on the lower lip. The cheek has a big highlight. There's a big highlight on the nose and the nostril. There's um, uh, also potential maybe like above the uh, upper lip hit that as well. It may not be necessary, but let's try it out and see. That'll draw attention to that distinctive upper lip shape. So there, now the highlights are in and uh, we can really see kind of how this is coming along. Next are to start um, going in and um, refining the background a little more. I think um, we got the portrait part to a certain point and the background needs to come up and work along with it. Um, this is creating a lot of glare. We'll turn the painting towards the camera and eliminate some glare here in a minute. Um, but uh, and going in with some lighter colors and pushing some of the saturations in there, picking up on like little colors that are in that background area. Because um, there's a pretty good contrast range. Like if we squint at the photo, see like a pretty bright area hitting right up next to the head, emphasizing the portrait. So we might be able to, to bring in some fairly sophisticated color ranges and some a big amount of variety in there to help that to help along with that. I 
We also want to avoid tangents. Like in the photo, there's a tangent right there where that green and the light shape in the background hit the exact point where the brim of the hat meets the top of the hat. So we want to avoid that a little bit. Um, we can bump up some of the value range on the left side as well. We definitely don't want to just like paint any of the background figures or anything too specific in the background. Um, because again, it is background information. Here's where we're going to spend a lot of time mixing, right? And less time painting. Because now the, the colors that you put down really, really matter. And you don't want to put the wrong ones down. So every time you make a move here and, you know, reevaluate, think, mix the new color, think about it. You know, you can even hold it up there, do a little dab, make sure that it's right. If it's not right, go ahead and mix a new color and change it. Here, a little bit of what I'm doing is um, compressing the value range down and lifting the blacks up um, into more mid-range values. The middle range has all the color, right? Like if we were thinking about value as related to color, you know, a pure color out of the tube, generally speaking, is going to be fairly middle value, even though the saturation is very high. It seems light and bright, but it's really not in terms of value. This also allows us to reevaluate the head shape, the overall head shape. Um, and this process is also allowing us to draw attention to the places that we want to draw attention to. Um, little refinements to the head shape, little refinements to the hat. To me, those little changes matter, you know. I noticed that the dark under the, uh, at the armpit there of the sweater, it's like too dark. Maybe the Sweaters too dark overall over on this shadow side, so I can lift that up. Keep the brush clean. As you paint longer, longer and longer with the same brush, um, it becomes more and more difficult to keep it clean especially with acrylic. And then here, you know, you're mixing more, more colors, trying to be very specific about it. And then remember, since we're working with the dark, the edges within the dark doesn't matter as much. So um, I can paint right over the sweater into the neck um, without really worrying about messing anything up. You can even blend further than that and all the way into the cheek um, and lower jaw. And then I just want to be careful about the edge as it goes from the dark side of the sweater to the light side of the sweater. Don't want it to be too sharp. Otherwise that'll create some problems for me. Then I'll have to go back and fix them. The other thing too is that there's always going to be more to do, you know. I could spend as many hours as I had on this, um, but I feel like this is in a, in a good place 
and a good stopping point for the demo. So as always, you know, none of this means anything until you try it for yourself. So get out your paints, find yourself a reference, and, uh, and enjoy uh, the process of painting.